Okay, please tell if this is 2.8, we're going to combine functions. So the first page here is all about the functions and how their domains work together. Okay? So we've done this many times before, is the fact that we're going to talk about what happens if I have functions f and g that have domains a and b. Then the functions f plus g, f minus g, and such are follows. Okay. Now, what we have here is I can add the two functions together. Maybe it's easier to start with the right-hand side. f of x plus g of x. They sometimes get lazy and they don't want to keep writing things over and over. So they combine them and say f plus g of x. So the functions f and g are added in terms of x. We can say the same thing. f minus g of x is f of x minus g of x. We can also go and say f g or f times g of x is f of x times g of x. And f divided by g of x is f of x divided by g of x. The stipulation on the last one is the fact that wherever g of x happens to be 0, you can't be there, right? You can't be whatever makes that g of x equals 0 on the denominator, or in the denominator. Okay? So we've all done this before. Whether we called it this notation or not, you have added functions together, rather than like terms. Basically, a lot of that. The one thing that we probably haven't talked about much is the fact that we have something called the domain. We all know the domain are the numbers you put <coughs> in. in. Thank you. Um, and look at this. All three, or all four of them, have A with an upside down U, B. All, all four of them. So X is in that, in all of them. The last one just said you can't be where G of X equals zero. So technically, all you're doing is A with that symbol B. What is that symbol B? What does that upside down U mean? Non-union. Yeah, union would have a U there. <coughs> What's that? Intersect. So where do they cross, right? Where do they have in common? So A intersects B. Set A and B where they intersect. So it has to be elements that both contain. Make sense? So if they both contain a 2 and a 4, then 2 and a 4 are part of the domain. But if one of them has a 2, the other one has a 3, and they don't share that, then the domain is not worth those two. So a couple problems we're going to talk about are just combining. What if I said f of x equals x cubed, and g of x equals this square root of x? We are going to go through all four of those to figure out what their functions combined would be. Most of them are pretty easy to figure out. And then, the second part to this problem is, can you evaluate a function that has a composition, or not a composition, but the um, combining of functions and then evaluate for a certain value? Like f plus g of 4. f minus g of 4. And of course, there's a couple different ways to handle that, and we'll talk about those in a second or two. So, the first one is f plus g. f plus g of x. The cool thing about it is all I'm doing is substituting the function for its letter. So function f is x cubed <laughs> plus the square root of x. Then you just have to ask yourself, are there any like terms? Can I put this together somehow? And everybody should say, no, you're done. If I wanted to do f minus g, then it's just x cubed minus the square root of x. Done. Right? The next one, though, there is a little bit of a, something we can do. So f g is equal to x cubed times the square root of x. 
Now this one we actually have to play with, we have to make it simplified. We all hopefully recognize that the square root of x <laughs> is what power? It's the one half. So we get x to the third power times x to the one half. And what do we do when we have common bases that are multiplied? We add their exponents. What's three plus a half? Ends up being seven halves. Can I simplify that anymore? No. I could put that back into radical notation, right? That would be the uh, square root of x to the seventh power, or square root of x with an x to the seventh inside. A couple <coughs> different ways there. And f over g would equal x cubed over x to the, or square root of x, yeah? Which I don't like square root of x, I'll change it to x to the one half. And when I'm dividing, I will, so that equals 5 halves. So x to the 5 halves. And again, you could put that to radical form, but we are done. So we did all of this stuff up here, find all of these. The only thing we didn't do now is talk about their domains. So the coolest thing about this, guys, is that everybody's domain from here all the way to here, right, will exclude the last one because that can be different because you can't be zero on the bottom. But all the top three all have the same domain. So I will let you do something like this where you kind of group them all together and then tell me the domain. The domain <laughs> d of x such that interesting, we got to know the domain of them individually, right? So let's kind of even go back up to the top. Back to our original functions. x cubed. What's the domain of x cubed? All real. I'm going to squeeze that in there. All real. That's what it says all real. If I go to the square root of x, you guys would say positive. Give me something better than that. x is greater than or equal to 0. I think that might be easier to try to combine in that way. So, where do they overlap? Where x is greater than or equal to 0. And if I wanted to use interval notation, we would just use 0, comma, infinity with a closed box on 0 because it's included in an open box, right? Open parentheses. <coughs> at infinity because it's not. Now here's the cool thing. Once you know that, the only thing you need to add for the last piece is it can't be something. What would make the bottom equal zero? Zero. So it's the same thing as instead of its x is greater than zero or zero to infinity but not included on each end. Boom. Just kind of add one more stipulation. You're dropping a little bit more out. That could potentially be in both. Could it be potentially be all of them have the same domain? Good. There might be something like a 2 on the bottom that will never be 0, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Remember, that's an or here. This is or. There are two different ways of saying the same thing, right? I mean, it's the same thing, just different notations. Okay, moving on. What's f plus g of 4? Now, would you guys be okay if I took the 4 and plugged it into f, and then plugged it into g, and then took those results and just added them together? Is that okay? I think so. 
because the function evaluated at a certain value is just each of their functions added values where you put in four. So the cool thing about it is if you've already done the work and solved for all of these things, guys, then you just use those. So in this case, the f plus g of 4 is equal to the 4 to the third power plus the square root of 4. And 4 to the third power is 64 plus 2, which is 66. <coughs> f minus g of 4 equals 4 cubed minus the square root of 4, which is 64 minus 2, 62. I'm not moving too fast. I, at least I hope that you guys couldn't comprehend what we just did. So I'm doing substituting, evaluating, that type of thing. Now, where I feel that there's a lot of benefit to this is when you use something like this, or it's f g of 3, where your new function, guys, that's resulted, has been simplified to a point where you don't see the individuals anymore. You gathered up like terms, you simplified it, so it almost just like it seems like it's a brand new function that basically allows us to do one thing or two versus separate events that have to come together. So in this case, it just becomes 3 to the 7 halves power. You can take your calculator out on that. That's 3 to the 7th power square root it. It's like 40 something, I think, or someone said it like last hour. Three to the seven halfths power. What do we get, guys? Or the square root of three to the seventh power. Forty-six point seven seven, approximately. So it's not too bad. And then, uh, of course, f divided by g of one. That's an easy one. One to the five halves power. One to any power is one. The next ones, I'm going to leave the evaluating for later. I want you guys just to add them, subtract them, multiply them, and divide them. If f of x is the x, uh, square root of x now, and g of x is the square root of 4 minus x squared. So f plus g, square root of x plus the square root of 4 minus x squared. I just use simple substitution. Can I do anything now, though? You always got to ask yourself, what's the next move? Can I do anything now? Can I add two square roots that are not the same? No. no. So you're done. F minus g, is that really going to change much? <coughs> nope. I think where a lot of your, your major work will come into play is when you're actually multiplying and dividing. Because that's when you have to start to use some of your rules. Because now you've got the square root of x times the square root of 4 minus x squared. When you have a square root times a square root, what are you allowed to do? I cannot cancel square roots. That only happens when when the square roots are the exact you same. Can them. We can combine them, how? Yes, guys, if it's a square root times square root, what's the square root of two times the square root of three? It's the square root of six. I could take the two and three and multiply them. It happens with any roots. So it's x times four minus x squared, which then will equal the square root of or x minus x cubed. I think having one function 
kind of put together is probably, like if I had to put a number in, this would be easier <coughs> than trying to do them separately and then multiply at the end. Especially if I had a long list of numbers that I was going to plug in, right? Or if I asked you to graph that, this might be easier to do it making the table this way than the other way. And f over g, square root of x over the square root of 4 minus x squared. Can I simplify that? Now I have a square root divided by square root. What can I do? Wait, someone back up. Only one at a time. What did you say? Yeah, why? Why would I want to multiply by the square root of 4 minus, four minus the square root of x? Or 4, four minus x squared. I wouldn't change the signs inside, not in the square root. Oh. Only if there was a plus, a 2, or something plus the square root. Then you have to multiply by the conjugate. To rationalize, to rationalize it. it. Yes, but wait a minute. Could I have also done this? Is that also a legal move? Mm -hmm. Just put it over one, or put one large square root? Yeah, that's still okay. That's still a legal move. But unfortunately, it doesn't cancel anything out. It doesn't simplify it, right? So instead, I do like what was said by Alex that I'm going to multiply Okay, I'm going to leave that off this side. I want to multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 4 minus x squared. Notice I'm not changing, whoops, I'm not changing the signs. And that way, we know that a square root times square root on the denominator of the same thing can cancel the square root. So the denominator will be a 4 minus x squared. And then, wait a minute. Isn't the top the exact same thing as this one? So 4x minus x cubed. This would be the more simplified version of f divided by g. Yep. We still need to do the domain and range. So going back to the top, square root of x has a domain of x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, for the square root of 4 minus x squared, though, you need to say 4 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. And solve that. Or where does 4 greater than or equal to x squared? At 2 and negative 2. So would you guys see that x would equal 2 and negative 2 as endpoints? It's a bad negative 2. But unfortunately, we're talking about an inequality. It's more than just a set of points, right? Or just single points. It's a set of a range. So therefore, you've got to graph it. 2, negative 2, and 2. They're closed dots because they're equal to. We know those values work. Where are the other values? Plug in zero. Does zero work? That's a bad code. Zero is right in the middle. Zero. Back to the original problem. Four minus zero still greater than or equal to zero? Yes. So these are all shaded in the middle. What about three? Three definitely make it a negative number, so that's not. How about four or negative three? Oh, it doesn't matter because you're squaring it. So the only answer for the second one is negative two is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to two. If you know you have to be greater than or equal to zero and fall between negative two is less than two, where do they overlap? Zero to two, are they included? 
Yes. Or 0, comma, 2 with closed brackets on each end, right? The last one, though. This one's interesting. Because it still has to be this answer, right? But now we have to take away any of the answers that would actually make this original problem bottom equal 0. So what value or values would actually make the bottom 0? And negative 2. But do we have to worry about the negative 2? No. So it modifies our problem because I can't be at 2. So now the last one is 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 2, or 0, 2, closed, open. Composition of functions now. Now we have f composite g of x. That right there is a little open zero or a little open circle. It kind of looks like fog, right? And that's f of g of x because I have the function f with g of x in it. That's in terms of x. <coughs> so if we let x, f of x equal x squared and g of x equal x minus 3, let's talk about f of g of x and g of f of x. And then we can evaluate these as well. So if I want f composite g, guys, I equate this to transplanting flowers. You don't like where a flower is, so you go and put a different one in its spot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to act like, and you're all working, that the one that's closest to the equal sign or closest to the x value, even up here, is the one that's inside <coughs> of the other. So you work your way inside out. So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to place g inside of f. So I am going to transplant x out of f, and I'm going to put inside there g of x. So I have f. And inside of there, I am going to put g of x. I'm taking the long way approach to this, guys. I'm doing this on purpose to kind of show what's going on. Which means g of x, which is x squared, looks like this now. I'm taking the x out of x squared, leaving this void that needs to be filled. And what am I going to fill it with? g of x. And g of x happens to be, again, I'm taking my time through the steps. g of x is x minus 3. And now you get x minus 3 squared, which we should know very quickly using expansion x squared minus 6x plus 9. That is f composite g of x. So the question is then, if I asked you this, what do I do with it? f composite g of 5. Now I just go to my answer and take the x out and put a 5. So it's 5 squared minus 6 times 5 plus 9. G goes 25 minus 30 plus 9, which happens to be 4. So it's really not that bad. And it doesn't matter, guys, if I would go back and I would say, hey, tell me this, F, composite G, composite F, Yeah, but all we're doing is saying that f is inside of g, and all of that is inside of f. So what I like to do is I like to write f first, supplant it with f, g of f, just like I did here, and work your way forward. And you'll have an answer. 
Are there any questions to that? So you might have some problems where you're going to have to do a lot of <laughs> algebra, but you have to use parentheses, work your way outward in or inward outward. It doesn't matter. It will be okay. Skipping that. The last thing I want to talk about is what if you are asked to take a function that looks complicated and break it to two smaller functions that are not so scary. So I gave you f of x is the fourth root of x plus 9. And then I ask you to find functions g, of x, g and x such that f composites g. So g is inside of f. You guys get that, that g is the one that has to be inside of f. So f is the larger function where g is inside of. You're happy, guys, when they give you stuff like this that has square roots or radicals because you can see that something looks to be inside of something else. What appears to be inside? x plus 9. So if that's the case, that means g of x is the x plus 9. That means f of x is what? Fourth root of x. Now, Mr. Konchak, why did x come back? x wasn't there. x you took out and put inside g of x. It's because each function separately needs to have its own terms of x. Everyone's in terms of x. Okay? So if I did f of g of x, you would put the x plus 9 where x was. And you get that problem. Now, what if I change this up just ever so slightly? What if I put a 3x plus 9? Now, I think everybody could agree that I could take 3x plus 9, that had to be my g of x. And I would have the same f of x. Can you see that? <laughs> but what if I changed it and told you that I'm going to let g of x equal 3x? What does f of x have to be to make that true? The fourth root of? It's not x plus 9. Ooh, yes, it's x plus 3. Why? Because, actually, let's think of this. No, it should still be 9. We did that wrong the other hour. If we went the other, we went the other way, it would be slightly different. I think I can agree with that. I can let this be 9. Because I am placing the 3x where x would be. So that would be 3x plus 9. I could have let g of x equal x plus 3. That's getting small on there. But that's the case. Then I would have an answer of the fourth root of 3x, because then when I plug in x plus 3 in for x, I would distribute the 3, okay? <coughs> so there's a couple different answers. The more complicated the problem is, the more options you can have, okay? Homework is on page 225, 1 through 61, every 5. Have a great day.